and we are thinking of them. So let's um, get started. So Dr. Cog embarked on this housing assessment journey back in September of 2023. The purpose of the assessment was to understand the scale, scope, and nature of housing need in our region. We recognize that many local communities are well underway with work to understand housing need in their communities. And the real impetus that motivated our board to launch the assessment was the premise that housing affordability across our region is larger than one municipality can take on alone. And a solid understanding of housing need will provide a foundation for future discussions about how best to work together regionally to address it. So I wanted to go over what we'll cover today. Our team is really excited to share what we've learned through this journey. Andy Taylor will walk us through the background and key findings of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, including an explanation of the methodology. Corey McGinnis will showcase a new data tool that captures the data analysis of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. This needs assessment articulates the current and future need for housing across our region. And we had the opportunity to bring the analysis down to smaller geographies. So Corey will walk us through how you can do that through a data dashboard. Though I wanna mention that our regional housing needs assessment is not an exercise in assigning individual responsibility to each local government. Rather, we hope it's a tool to assist local governments in their work to address housing need. We certainly want to hear your questions, so Caitlin's service will help facilitate a question and answer session during this webinar. And as we dive into the content today, we encourage you to engage with us. If you have questions during the presentations, please enter them into the question and answer chat box. We'll be addressing your questions during that Q&A portion of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available to you after today. And lastly, I just wanted to mention another way that we will be available to all of you to answer your questions. We'll be hosting office hours in the, in the weeks ahead to answer your municipality specific questions in more detail. So after this webinar, please look out for a communication from us about how to sign up for those office hours. Again, thanks for being here today and let's get started. Well, thank you, Sheila. Um, as Sheila said, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to provide uh, leadership to the regional planning and analytics teams here at Dr. Cog. And I'm really excited to share more about the regional housing needs assessment and to provide some context for the housing need dashboard tool that Corey is gonna uh, demonstrate for you uh, just after uh, a little bit of this context here. So let me back up to MetroVision for a second uh, before we get started talking about the regional housing needs assessment. A MetroVision is our regional plan with the version that was unanimously adopted by Dr. Cog's board back in 2017. With that version, housing is now called out in addition to the longstanding themes of growth and development, transportation, and the environment. And the focus uh, of that language uh, in MetroVision is on housing options and objectives to diversify housing stock, supply more attainable housing, and find more opportunities for this diverse and or attainable housing with great access to our region's multimodal transportation network. Uh, since these additions to MetroVision, Dr. Cog has been finding strategic opportunities to work on housing-related topics but really began laying out a path to a regional housing strategy after a series of discussions at the board level and with some other stakeholders. And, and moving down that path now with funding support uh, from the Department of Local Affairs and through our federal transportation planning funding. Uh, the housing needs assessment is really just that first cog in this broader housing strategy and planning work uh, with the ultimate goal to see housing more strategically integrated in future plan updates here at Dr. Cog. Uh, but lots has changed over the course of just uh, this first cog in developing the regional housing needs assessment. Uh, we initiated the assessment in October with a data analysis heavy set of tasks. Uh, scoping and largely completing that data analysis prior to the introduction and subsequent passage 
of Colorado House Bill 24, uh, uh, one, uh, 74, uh, which uh, began uh, to outline a methodology for uh, regional and local housing needs assessments. So our intent behind initiating this assessment went beyond just this data analysis piece of identifying housing needs. Uh, the assessment report includes information on barriers to meeting these housing needs. We wanted to move, help move the conversation beyond just to focus on local land use regulations and processes, including uh, discussion of infrastructure, barriers related to the market, funding, finance, community will, uh, while including also a section to help extend this work towards uh, our, our next step at Dr. Cog of a regional housing strategy. So it includes a framework uh, to help us continue moving in that direction uh, with uh, this housing needs assessment report. However, today I'm just going to focus on uh, the regional and submarket housing needs calculations. However, we will be sending out a link uh, to uh, this report, uh, which is now available on our website. So here's what our project team found. Unlike some other regions uh, struggling with their own housing crises, we are still building housing, but that's not been quite enough to keep pace with growth and make up for slower construction during past downturns and economic cycles. Uh, Low-income households defined as those making 60% or less of the area median income make up the largest share of our housing need. Uh, some of that uh, low-income household need is driven by our aging population, but it's also part of the trend towards smaller households and that need for more diverse housing types. And as I noted, we are still building housing in this region, and that growth, especially in terms of affordability and diversity, are not evenly distributed across the region. So let me start by giving credit to our consultant team led by Echo Northwest in developing this methodology. They were able to draw on their extensive experience in other regions and local and with local governments, uh, and even at the state and national level. Uh, and that having that um, experience um, let us focus our attention to customize this methodology to for our region and for the data resources that we also have here at Dr. Cog. And so, in terms of steps. Um, I'll be walking us through these four steps um, to break it down to help uh, build understanding of what it is that, that um, this housing needs assessment includes and looks at. Uh, we look across the entire region here at the start because individuals' housing location decisions do cross jurisdictional boundaries and do directly affect everyday travel options and distances involved for households. Uh, we then work to understand that need across different income levels. Uh, and also across the different regional submarkets that we're creating, and also even to a local government level, um, as you'll see when we uh, demo the dashboard. Uh, this top-down approach, starting at the regional level and then distributing down uh, to other geographies, allows us to use richer disaggregate data to get at household income, while also allowing us to align with household forecasts available from the State Demography Office, which really aligns well with the forecasting work we already do at Dr. Cog related to regional transportation planning. So let's break this down one step at a time. Uh, the project team's methodology accounts for current need in two buckets. Uh, current need in terms of underproduction, through an analysis of changes in household formation over time, and also accounting for homeless families that would not necessarily be found in many of the foundational data sets we'd rely on in household forecasting work like the census. So these are households that uh, just by their circumstance may not have an address, so may not show up in those survey instruments. And so we supplement it uh, as a part of this understanding of current need. But rather than stop with this shortage, this methodology also looks at making up for this current need. Uh, it uh, looks beyond making up for this current need to also look at what it would take to keep up with projected needs related to growth, and primarily that growth related to uh, the state demography office forecasts. So here's what that looks like between 2023 and 2050. Uh, we're looking at a need for over 500,000 new units to meet current and future need. 
with that future need, as I said, being driven by the household growth forecast uh, that we derive from the state demography office. And also um, some of the questions that we've already heard about that and, and where that number is coming from. That number of achieving over 500,000 units also is to aim for a healthier vacancy rate uh, that allows for more housing options for more households. We also want to look out over a shorter time horizon. 20 plus years is, is great to help align with uh, long range planning work, like that's the, which is happening in all of your local comprehensive plans or with our regional transportation plan or even with MetroVision. Uh, but 10 years may have more relevance in this space uh, with the need for housing action in the near term and especially not to spread that current need out over too many years. Um, it's worth mentioning here the forthcoming methodology for needs assessments that's coming out of uh, being developed by the state coming out of Senate Bill 174. You might have seen some specifics in that legislation about the types of data points to be considered in a needs assessment. But what's still to be determined uh, through the development of the state's methodology uh, will be things like the planning horizon. And so what's worth noting here that we've been able to develop through this housing needs assessment is a capability uh, here at Dr. Cog to adapt to these two options, looking out to 2050, looking out 10 years or others. Um, we're, we're prepared to be able to, to do that math and apply this methodology um, as uh, uh, the state's methodology also um, uh, develops. Uh, income is a big part of understanding household needs. So getting past just looking at overall housing need and this big number, income is really critical because when a large share of a household's income goes toward housing, they have less to spend on meeting their other critical household needs. And so with this methodology, we're able to look at area median income, factoring in household size, and we're also able to look forward at future need. And this methodology is even accounting for the forecast that our region will have a growing share of older adults, a reality that we're already experiencing and expect to continue experiencing. And that will drive some of the growth in the lower area median income cohorts uh, in, our, uh, in our forecast. And so we're then comparing that demand for housing affordable to different income levels to the current supply of housing uh, we are looking at the supply of housing and making some adjustments for price filtering in the rental market. And so the methodology is taking into account some of those real estate dynamics as well. And so here's what that looks like out to 2032. Uh, we're forecasting total demand in those different income groups relative to area median income. And so total demand uh, is that uh, uh, dark uh, orange outlined area. And then we're comparing it to supply, affordable at price points that would keep those households from being cost burdened. And so that's the shaded orange area. The gap between the shaded area and the border is the need. And so the biggest gaps in the forecast are in that zero to 30% and 30% to 60% area median income. So the next step is to start moving away from just the regional scale numbers. While those are important part of the conversation, uh, to move to a smaller unit of geography, we first created these regional sub-markets. Project teams split the region up into five different sub-markets. The goal was for these to be contiguous. Uh, to reflect some commute patterns using a clustering algorithm to try and capture a high number of commute origin and destinations in one submarket as possible, and to be able to leverage disaggregate data products from the Census Bureau that allow for lots of custom tabulation to understand these different submarkets, uh, which means that these submarkets comprise one or more uh, public use micro sample areas. And so that's one of the constraints we have with this methodology is, is using that level of geography um, to draw these submarkets. 
Uh, but if you can't quite tell where your community is on the map and, and where some of these lines fall, um, the dashboard tool that, that Corey is about to demo um, has some ways that you can start to, to drill down and interact with these uh, geographies uh, to where you can explore um, where your communities fall. So with regional housing need, uh, current and future by income, and with these regional submarkets identified, we can move on to this last step, uh, distributing that regional need to each submarket, and then actually even beyond that uh, to local jurisdictions to help demonstrate what it would take collectively, perhaps to meet regional housing need at a variety of scales. So as Sheila was mentioning, these aren't intended to be um, targets or goals per se, but a demonstration of what it might take. The project team created a model to distribute housing need uh, to a submarket and local level. Uh, so this includes different categories of, dis uh, of, of distribution criteria, population and employment, which have a direct connection to housing demand, and pull in Dr. Cog's small area forecast. Uh, sustainability, especially as it relates to multimodal accessibility, tying in our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and some of the key geographies uh, and corridors associated with that plan. And also housing as it relates to availability and affordability. And so there are actually two sets of criteria among those groups. Uh, one set is applied to the current need, so that, that underproduction and, and homeless number that I was talking about, that current need, um, that is uh, a part of the current conditions distribution criteria. The other is to future need. Uh, there's no complicated waiting scheme here, so the lists are kept simple on purpose. Um, uh, too many factors, and then none of the factors are, are really playing a significant role. Um, some of these do carry an inverse weight, like a low share of affordable units would actually trigger a greater distribution of current need to a submarket. While all these criteria are used in the submarket allocation, then that distribution a local to local jurisdictions uh, just uses the first three from each list. And that is somewhat related to the data availability um, and, and just how that uh, makes sense for some of the other um, uh, that, that make more sense to be applied at a submarket level. And so you'll see uh, the first three on each of these lists uh, pop up as Corey gets into talking about uh, the dashboard itself. And so here's the result of that distribution, at least a submarket level. Um, it's shown in the red bar that's stacked on top of the existing uh, units that are in the green bar shown for context. And you'll be able to explore this, even the submarket numbers and the local numbers in much more detail through the dashboard. And so just to wrap up again and come back uh, to the four steps uh, in our methodology. Here are those four steps again, all in one spot for reference. And so I'll be handing it over to Corey to walk you through the dashboard uh, where you'll be able to see uh, the results of this methodology more fully. Thank you, Andy. I'm just gonna share my screen here and turn over to the dashboard. So thank you all for joining us here. My name is Corey McGinnis, and I'm a data scientist at Dr. Cog. I'm going to walk through and demonstrate this dashboard, which will be available for all of you to use. I'll walk through how to navigate it, how to find your local jurisdiction, and how to interpret all the results and charts that we have here. So as we explain here on this welcome page, you can use this dashboard to explain or explore estimates of sub-regional and local housing need that are distributed down from the regional level. And also to reiterate what Sheila and Andy have said earlier on this webinar, these local estimates are not to be interpreted as housing targets that each municipality must achieve. Instead, we're hoping that local governments can use these estimates to help understand the scope and scale of housing need in the region and to see what meeting our regional need could look like at a local level. 
So first, I'm going to move from this welcome page over to the submarkets tab, and we're going to start on this map of the region. So it, prevents the, it presents the region split into five different submarkets and overlaid with jurisdictions in the region. If I turn off this jurisdictions um, label, you can better see the five submarkets. I can click through to show what they are. So here's the West Market, the North Market, North Central, Central, and Southeast. And just as a reminder from what you learned in Andy's portion of the presentation, these submarkets are really important for understanding the local need estimates because those estimates are going to be distributed down from the subregional level. Now, if I reselect jurisdictions here and we can see the overlay again, you can use this to better uh, understand where a community lands into the subregions. So, for instance, Lakewood, I can see here, is entirely in the central submarket. Meanwhile, a place like Golden is split across three submarkets, so its local need estimate is going to come from a portion of the need in three different submarkets. That's the West, Central, and North Central. You can also move over to this submarkets table, which is going to show you the same information in a different form. Here, it may be a little easier to look at a submarket and see what are all the different municipalities that land in the submarket. And you can also use these asterisks to see communities that span multiple submarkets. For instance, Arvada, you can find portions of it in the north, north central, and west submarkets. Now I'm going to move over to this local needs tab where we'll start out by exploring local need by income. So this is going to default to presenting 10-year housing needs estimates for our five submarkets. The label to the right of each of these bars is going to show us the total need over the 10-year period, and then these different colored segments of the bar are going to break out that need by affordability level. So for example, this top bar here is telling us that our 10-year need estimate for the central submarket is about 70,000 units. Then if we look at the furthest left dark blue segment, that indicates that about 25,000 of those units should be affordable to households making between 0 and 30% of the area median income adjusted for household size. Then the next segment to the right is showing us the number of needed units affordable to houses households making between 30 and 60% of the area median income, and so on. And so while this dashboard is going to default to showing you the subregional results, you can go over to the left of your screen and use this drop down to select any municipalities that you're interested in. So I'm going to open this up, clear the selections, and for this presentation, I'm going to select the largest municipality in each of our submarkets. So that's going to be Aurora in the southeast. Boulder in the north, Denver in the central submarket, portion of Golden in the west submarket, and Thornton in the north central submarket. So now you can see these same housing needs estimates by affordability level, but distributed down to the local jurisdictions from the submarkets. So for example, our estimate of total need for Aurora in this top bar is almost 28,000 units. And if we add up the three segments of the bar on the left, that's telling us that our estimate is that almost 20,000 of those units should be affordable to households making less than 80% of the area median income adjusted for household size. So you can use this tab to find any jurisdiction that you want um, and see what our local estimate of housing need is. This next tab over here goes into the weighting metrics that Andy was describing in his presentation. So this chart is going to show the relative importance of six factors in determining a local jurisdiction's need estimate. Those factors are current and future jobs, current and future population, and current and future transit access, which you can see in the legend at the bottom of the screen. This chart, while a little complicated to understand at first, is really important for offering transparency into how the local needs estimates were calculated for each jurisdiction. To take a step back and remind you of what Andy said in his presentation, we have two different segments of need that we're estimating, current need and future need. And we're using these current metrics on the left side of the chart to distribute need down to the local level, the current need down to the local level, and these future metrics to distribute the future need down to the local level. 
across the region, 10-year total future need is much greater than current need. So that's why you see that these future metrics have much higher weights compared to the current metrics. So in this chart, you can also toggle to look at just the current and future weighting needs metrics. I'm going to start over on the current need metrics because I think it's a little easier to understand. So right now, for instance, if I'm looking at Denver, this third bar in the middle of the chart, you can interpret it as follows. 34% of Denver's current need is determined by its share of current jobs in the central submarket. 31% of its current need is determined by its share of current population in the central submarket. And 35% of its current need is determined by its share of current transit access in the submarket. What this does not mean is that 34% of jobs or 31% of population in the central submarket are landing in Denver. Those numbers would be far too low. The reason that these metrics all have similar weights is because Denver has roughly equal shares of those metrics in the subregion. But by contrast, if you were looking at a place like Golden, you'll see that current transit access makes up almost half of the weight for its current need estimate. And the reason for that is because in the submarkets that Golden lands in, its share of current transit access is considerably higher than its share of current jobs or current population. Now I'm going to toggle over to the future need categories so that you can see what the weights look like when we're just looking at future need. Now you can see that, for example, in a place like Thornton, 44% of its future housing need is coming from its share of future population in the north central submarket. And again, the reason that this share is higher than the weight for future jobs or future transit access is because Thornton's share of future population is larger than its shares of future jobs or future transit access. Now I'll recombine these two categories. So once again, you can have another look at how all these weights contribute to current need estimates for each of these municipalities. And I would encourage you to explore these weights on your own when you have a chance. Now for the last section, I'm going to move over to this key trends tab, which has a series of charts that provide context around housing needs in the Denver region. Starting with the first tab, housing burden, it shows the share of cost burden renter households for each of the selected municipalities in the years 2000 and year 2022. The golden portion of each chart, as you can see in the legend here, shows the share of renter households spending more than 30% of their household income on housing costs. The coral portion of the chart shows the share of renter households spending more than 50% of their household income on housing costs. So we can see across all these municipalities here, the increase in housing cost burdening over the past 20 years and large shares of burdened and severely burdened renters underscores the need for a regional strategy to improve housing affordability. The next tab I'll take us to shows permitting trends for each of the municipalities we've selected. So this is the number of units permitted since the year 2000. These unit counts are broken out by type of permit so you can see how many new units have been for single family homes, duplexes, or large apartment buildings, for instance. If you look at Denver, you can see that most of the units permitted over the past few years have been for large multifamily structures. This tab overall can help us understand the amount and type of housing that's been built across the region and in certain municipalities over the past couple decades. The next tab here shows our current housing supply. This is just the current number of housing units for each municipality according to recent census data. And then these last two tabs are coming from Dr. Cog's small area forecast. The first shows household growth through 2050 by municipality and the second shows job growth through 2050 by municipality. Now, these forecasts are driven by the State Demography Office's own household and employment forecasts, which tell us that while growth is slowing around the region, we can still expect a lot more people to live and work here in the next 20 to 30 years. So it's important that we're forward thinking about growth when addressing our future housing needs. So now that I've walked through this portion of the dashboard, I have two more features to show you. You'll notice on the left, there are download data and download plots features. 
I've already downloaded those, but you can click on them to get your own versions. What it's going to do is give you the underlying data for these plots and a PowerPoint with all of these plots loaded for the municipalities you've selected. So if I go over to the Excel file, you can see different tabs for the data underlying need by income, the weighting metrics, current number of housing units, permitting data, burdening data, our household growth and job growth forecasts. And then if I take you over to the PowerPoint, you can see that we have populated um, a PowerPoint file with all the different charts that you might be interested in sharing. These include the jurisdictions by submarket, local need by income, the local need weighting components, and then the burdening, permitting, current supply, household growth, and job growth data. So you can use these tools to help dig into the data yourself and maybe create charts that you want to use in any presentations you might be giving. And as a reminder, Doctors Cog staff can be a resource for you. If you're planning to use any of these materials in a presentation, we would strongly encourage you to sign up for office hours to talk through them so we can provide you with any needed support. So thank you for following along with me in this presentation. I hope that this helped you feel better equipped to access and navigate the dashboard and understand all the numbers in it. So I'm now going to turn over to my colleague, Caitlin, who will be moderating our Q&A. Thank you. We will move into the Q&A segment of our webinar. Thank you for all the questions that have been submitted so far. And if you have a question that you haven't submitted yet, please do so now in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And for the panelists, just a reminder to unmute yourself, turn on your camera to provide your response. For our first question, I'd like to introduce members of our consultant team, Echo Northwest. Tyler Bump and Justin Sherrill are with us today. Andy mentioned earlier that Echo Northwest has led the consultant effort to create this regional housing needs assessment, and they bring just a wealth of knowledge on this topic. So we're fortunate to have their expertise and perspective today. So our first question that's been submitted to the chat is, can you please speak to whether your methodology considers doubled up households that don't show up in demography growth projections, but are hidden in housing demand? Hi, yeah, so uh, Justin Sherrill, Echo Northwest. And uh, in response to this question, uh, yes, the model does consider doubled up households, maybe not in that explicit sense of like, are we looking at uh, uh, PUMS data for some sort of evidence of like doubled or tripled up households, but we do consider like essentially that topic through the underproduction, through the calculation of current need. And the way that we do this is by essentially estimating the number of what we call missing households. And that is to say by age cohort, we compare the headship rate uh, by age cohort for the Dr. Cog region using 2000 uh, decennial data and then apply that headship rate to the current population by those same age cohorts for the region to essentially try to estimate the number of uh, households by age cohort that would have existed under the economic conditions of 2000 uh, and then subtract the current uh, households by those age cohorts. That delta, the, 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 the difference between those two numbers is what we refer to as missing households. And we add those to, uh, to the current households in the calculation of underproduction to get at essentially, yes, missing households. So hopefully uh, that, that answers that question. Thank you. And for our next question, uh, Echo Northwest team, if you could help us out with this one as well, um, what household size do AMIs represent on the distribution of need? And do those figures represent figures at the zero to 60 AMI level account for seniors who may have a lower income due to retirement, but a higher likelihood of already being homeowners? Um, these are great questions. So standard practice uh, at Echo Northwest and in this model is that we scale AMI by household size using the standard HUD methodology. So when we're estimating the, when we're converting household income into AMI using PUMS data, we're using the scaled AMI by household size so that, you know, the uh, one person household is 70% of the four person household and so on and so forth. So those calculations of household income are scaled by household size. And then we, when we talk about 
uh, housing unit affordability in terms of uh, AMI, we are scaling the uh, four person uh, regional AMI by the bedroom count using the standard HUD methodology in the same way. And then on the topic of the zero to 60 older households, that is something that we investigated and, and wanted to look at. We'd make no adjustment though for specific age cohorts and or like scaling down or up their AMI. Um, or, or adding that on uh, on top in some sort of uh, fashion. So that is something that could be iterated on in the future, but it is not something that the model currently uh, adjusts for. Great, thank you. We have a question here. Is it possible to add unincorporated areas to the communities you can select on the dashboard or even portions of the unincorporated areas? For example, the four square mile area along Parker Road from Mississippi to Illith is an unincorporated desi census designated place with a population over two, uh, over 20,000. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So yeah, we at Dr. Cog, we have the ability here to make changes to how this dashboard works. And one thing we have indicated interest in exploring internally is the ability to add census designated places to that dashboard. One thing also I'm realizing I didn't show you uh, when I was walking through the dashboard is there's an additional option you can select for the whole unincorporated portion of a subregion. So you can explore housing need there, but we are looking at it possibly including census designated places in the future. Yeah. And one of the items on our list is to to add in, in addition to just the unincorporated within an entire uh, submarket, is um, the unincorporated area for a given county as well. Great, thank you for that clarification. And uh, Corey, while you're on, um, we have another question for you. Uh, it is, will cost burden data for homeowners be included at some point? I think that's. A topic that if people are interested in seeing, we definitely have the ability to take that census data and add it to the dashboard. Great, thank you. The next question is permitting issues entitlements, are the permitting numbers in the dashboard entitlements or actual building permits issued? Um, Echo Northwest staff or Corey, um, could you take that one? Sure, I can take this one, um, the data source that we use for permits of the, is the HUD state of the city's data source, which is reported by jurisdictions to HUD, but generally is permits issued, not entitlements. Um, but there is a, a sort of review period or re review process for local jurisdictions to provide feedback to HUD as part of that. But it should be permits, generally permits issued is the count. Thank you. And does the methodology account for deed restrictions versus naturally occurring affordable housing and current and future needs calculations? We have in the um, uh, in the final report, we do look at uh, housing affordability for the current housing stock across income categories across the region. And so we do look at the essentially the prevalence or lack of, in many cases, of naturally occurring affordable housing in the housing market today. What we are doing with the forecast housing needs being both under production and that future population forecast need is um, identifying it by income category, not assuming that there's going to be any long-term deed restriction, just because the duration or the timeline for deed restriction really dependent upon the source of funding for affordable housing. So we're defining the need and that it's a policy funding program piece around the sort of duration of the affordability restriction associated with that that needed needed um, housing by income category. Thank you. Next question is for Corey. Um, are you able to clarify the information on the dashboard of is it 10 year or 50 year? Um, and then what portion of the need. Okay, so clarify if the information on the dashboard is 10 year or 50 year. So for example, Denver has widely reported that their share is 44K, but our screen showed 54K. What portion of the need above 80% of AMI is ownership versus rental? Yeah, so the 
I can answer those in pieces. So first, those those need numbers are going to be the 10-year need numbers that show up on the screen. So that should be need out through 2032. Um, as for the Denver, I think so. My understanding is that the 44,000 need number is for um, units in Denver that would be affordable to households making 100 per or affordable to households at 100% or less of the area median income. And so that's where that 44 number would come from. And 54,000 would be the entire need, including 100 plus AMI. Um, as far as the portion of need above 80% that is AM, that's ownership versus rental, we're not breaking that down um, in this dashboard or in our housing needs estimates. Um, my understanding is that we wanted to look at total need right now, but that ownership versus rental need may be more of a policy choice that communities would be interested in making. Great, thank you. Our next question is um, either for Corey or for the Echo Northwest staff. Do we have commuter info to see where employees live versus where they work? Uh, you can you can answer it, Justin. Yes. Um, do we have it? Uh, yes, we've used loads, uh, origin, destination, uh, commuting data, in various stages throughout the project. Um, I think primarily we we brought it in during the definition the the um, uh, definition of the subregions essentially uh, commuting data and um, the uh, shares of commuters that uh, uh, commute into or out of certain subregions or or hubs essentially did feature pretty prominently in the definition of those subregions. Um, we tried a lot of different methods, but but yeah, that was kind of a core piece of that. Um, but uh, we've used it in various uh, bits and pieces for contextual use throughout the process as well. Great, thank you. We have a few questions on here um, about the link to the dashboard and how can people access the dashboard. You will receive an email following this webinar. All the registrants to the webinar will receive the email that includes a link to the dashboard for you to dive in a little deeper. Our next questions are for Andy. Uh, the first question is, Dr. Cog confident that this regional housing needs assessment meets the requirements of Senate Bill 174 for regional housing needs assessments? And if not, will Dr. Cog's regional housing needs assessment be updated? Yeah, um, that's a question that, that we've been, um, I think, navigating ourselves since the passage of 174 and even as it was being um, discussed uh, and changed uh, during drafting. And I think um, what Senate Bill 174 does is it lays out a lot of different things that need to be considered in a methodology for both regional and local um, housing needs assessments. So um, the legislators drafting that bill included, you need to be considering these different data points. And so we can look at those lists and, and start to compare with what we're considering and what we're doing um, uh, in this needs assessment. Um, but we also know that there is a forthcoming process um, from uh, the Department of Local Affairs um, to create this methodology. That's really what 174 does is it, it instructs uh, the state agencies to create this methodology um, for doing these assessments of what would be considered an acceptable assessment. Yes, there are those these lists of things that, that need to be included. But like I had mentioned in my presentation, there are some things that right now the, the bill itself, the legislation itself is silent on um, related to things like how what the time horizon is that we need to consider. We know how often we need to update uh, a needs assessment, but not necessarily um, how far forward it should look. Um, and so we are, what we're really confident in is that we're prepared to help speak into that conversation about this methodology development, um, that based on the work that we've done, I'm really happy that we've proceeded when we did, um, with this work that we've, uh, equipped ourselves with the capability, um, and understanding to help participate in that conversation about 
what we see with the data we have with our experience with this work now, but also um, with some of the data limitations that, that we know are out there um, that, that maybe didn't come up during discussions of that bill. So um, are we confident? We, we know that, that our work has been supported by um, the Department of Local Affairs with, um, with directly with some funding and with participation um, through the development of this process. And so um, we know that we're going to try to work to make sure that, that this can be something that can be acceptable under 174. And so we're going to keep an eye on whether that's going to need mean uh, you know, maybe there's some addendums to address certain data pieces. Uh, maybe there are some pieces that need to get added at some point, but we'll be keeping an eye on that. We also want to recognize that the needs assessment is a living document in some ways, that um, the, the factors that go into it, things like the, the county level forecasts of, of households and employment, that these are big things that can start to, to, to shift uh, what the regional needs assessment, what those total numbers might be. And so we also want to recognize that that even as something like um, Dr. Cog will be updating its small area forecast, that there are other reasons why we may have to revisit um, the needs assessment. And so um, we, we do anticipate continuing to come back to this document um, and, and not consider this a one and done kind of thing, um, that we really have built the capability and to, to be able to do this work and follow through on this methodology as needed, um, building on what Echo Northwest um, um, has developed for us. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, we're, we'll be waiting to see. Thank you. And Andy, this one is for you as well. Um, asking if this is going to be leveraged to match with the transit-oriented communities bill language and other legislation work and a comment that um, those efforts would be paired nicely. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the things where, to, to double back on the last question a little bit, one of the things that we considered in our needs assessment methodology when I was going through those distribution criteria are some of these key geographies related to our transportation investments, where we have transit today, where we're building our transit system in the future, um, where we have some of these pedestrian focus areas is even in there. And so we feel like we've we've tied in some of these key pieces related to uh, transit-oriented areas. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a, a perfect analog and connection to um, something like the TOC bill, um, but we do recognize that there are communities that have already worked to create more housing opportunities in these areas. And I think there will be some great touch points, especially as local communities start creating their, their local action plans and seeing these as opportunity areas. Um, but yeah, it, um, it'd be interesting to see as um, local governments continue uh, uh, working forward uh, with uh, uh, the TOC legislation, uh, trans-oriented communities legislation, and with um, our needs assessment, if there's more opportunities for interconnections. Um, but um, the we we do want to acknowledge that looking at the whole needs assessment report in general, we're looking at a lot of different barriers and the TOC bill really does just focus in on zoning. And we, we wanna make sure that the conversation goes beyond that um, to look at some of the other barriers um, to more affordable housing options in um, some of these locate key locations. Great, thank you. If you could stay on for just one more, Andy. <laughs> um, could you explain please how Dr. Cog is working with DOLA, Department of Local Affairs, so that the data and information provided by this effort is compatible and supports the state's needs assessments, expectations and requirements? Um, right now, it's just, we're having conversations. We know that DOLA is standing up a big stakeholder effort and, um, I think we do actually have um, uh, KC from DOLA on the line. If, if um, KC, if you wanted to to speak a little bit about that effort that's coming up that, that Dr. Cog plans to participate in and is encouraging local governments to participate in as well. 
Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. Casey McPherson from DOLA. And yes, we are standing up what I would also call a large stakeholder engagement effort across um, multiple of the new land use and housing related laws, about four to five, depending on how you slice it. Um, the idea of that is going to be to set up recurring stakeholder engagement meetings monthly. And of course, this uh, H&A methodologies um, question and tools is going to be one of the first products that we're going to be putting before stakeholders. We're hoping to launch um, multiple types of efforts. So depending on where you're coming from, if you're a subject, bleh, subject jurisdiction and participating directly in those meetings, or if you're just interested and wanting to follow along, we'll also be having a um, two-way communication engagement website. It's not live yet. We only have our static one with the basic information at the moment, um, but we do have that going on. And I would agree with what Andy just said that yes, we've been having some regular meetings and check-ins. Um, it's been fabulous to watch this process and where it's going. In fact, we're quite thankful uh, to Dr. Cog um, treading the path uh, before we've been obligated to um, go down it. And we're looking forward to working closely um, with those interested through our big process. If you have further questions, please do visit our website. I'll be happy to drop a link in the chat after I mute myself again. And please always feel free to email me as well. Thanks. Thank yes, you. And, oh, sorry, and if, you go missed ahead, that, Andy. if you missed that link in the chat, um, I think it's also queued up in the, the email that we'll be sending out as well. So Thank you. Our next question on here is for the Echo Northwest staff. Has water availability and cost been correlated at all to the housing needs number? There we go. During the, one moment, during the, um, the arena development process, we had a number of conversations, uh, both interviews and focus groups with utility providers across the region. Um, that being said, there are an insane amount of water districts across the Front Range and the Denver region. So having the understanding of capacity constraints and individual project lists through capital facilities plans for each of those districts is, uh, is really tough to do. Um, when we do this work in other places that have been doing housing needs assessments and what, what I would call sort of coordinated um, housing planning with growth management, including infrastructure. Um, the housing needs assessments are aligned with uh, utility, including water service um, deficiencies and identification of priority projects to better serve the needs or align those needs um, from a capacity planning standpoint too. So um, it is conversations that we've had as part of this, but also um, a lot of those uh, either individual project level or system needs on the utility side just are, are part of the sort of policy investment uh, alignment with local jurisdictions and the water providers and, and utility providers more broadly. I Thank hope that's you. Helpful, Caitlin. Yes, very helpful, thanks. This is uh, the last chance for anyone attending the webinar to add any more to the chat. We have gotten to the bottom of the questions that have been asked. Um, thank you everyone for your engagement, for attending today and for the great questions that have been asked so far. Any last minute questions, just uh, type them in uh, really quick right now. I also wanna open up the floor to any of the panelists if you have a, a follow-up comment or, or anything else um, that you felt like needed to be shared that would provide helpful context or clarification to anything that was discussed during the question and answer session. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to address, I think, one of the FYIs that came in about um, state legislation requiring a breakdown of rental versus ownership in housing needs assessment. I think that's a, some of the, the methodology pieces we're looking at. We know we can slice and dice the need a lot of different ways. We could look at rent and own. For instance, we could look at tenure. We could look seniors. There's a lot of different ways. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how we need to then supplement our understanding uh, and, and how we can do that with just the number of ways we may be called on to slice and dice. And so that's something um, we'll, we'll be uh, keeping an eye on. Um, I just wanted to address that one comment that was still out there. 
Great, thank you, Andy. I don't see any more questions coming into the chat. So if you wanna wrap us up here, it's good timing, about five minutes left. So uh, just in terms of next steps, um, we're here at, uh, at the virtual meeting here today, the uh, webinar today to share and introduce this uh, dashboard um, to understand housing need in a regional context, but being able to see some of this at local number level. Um, we are continuing to work on this path towards a regional housing strategy and plan to publish a request for proposals um, next month. Um, as Sheila did mention, um, we will have these bookable office hours for folks that have more specific questions um, or, or just want to get into a little bit about their jurisdiction's numbers. Um, um, so we'll have that link going out uh, in the follow-up email. Um, we have uh, also a presentation uh, at with the City County Manager's uh, quarterly meeting um, that Dr. Cog hosts um, to give um, some similar information and context. Um, but also we will be having future conversations with um, the Dr. Cog board um, uh, on the, the local housing needs dashboard and uh, working to accept uh, the regional housing needs assessment. And so we're happy uh, if you uh, get questions because our Dr. Cog board members are local elected officials. Um, if you um, hear anything, if you want to reach out, if you have questions, please feel free to do so. Um, in terms of next steps, um, once this email goes out, um, feel free to visit and explore that dashboard. As Like I said, sign up for those office hours or um, feel free to email me. Um, and I can, if I can't handle that question, I know how to get it in the hands of someone who can. So um, I'm happy to, to direct those inquiries as needed. So um, I just really wanna thank you for your time and attention today. Um, and, uh, just really, um, really excited to see this work getting out there. Um, and, uh, just happy to, uh, be in this position to, to talk about this, um, with you today. All righty. Well, thank you very much, everyone.